Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our little Sunday conversation. My name is John Barnwell. I'm here in the city of Detroit, north of Detroit, that is, and also in the greater metropolitan areas. My old buddy, Douglas Gabriel, from American Intelligence Media, and uh, we're both lifelong anthroposophists. So if, if that's your field of interest, then you might find this engaging. Our topic today is Rudolf Steiner and the Holy Grail, part two. And in this particular conversation, I mean, that stirs up a lot, first of all, because the Holy Grail could be used as a catch all phrase for the whole body of Rudolf Steiner's work, which occupies 36 and a half feet of shelf space in the original collected edition. And so that's, in my mind, the most difficult subject you can study and in the mind of many others, though I've heard. And so we wanna try and approach this, this edifice of, of uh, human wisdom that is wisdom, uh, the wisdom of becoming fully human. And that's the title of the most recent catalog I got from uh, the Rudolf Steiner publishing house here in the US, becoming fully human. And so that's an interesting challenge because you could go, well, geez, I thought I heard he was. <laughs> but no, it's a work in progress and that's, Part of what uh, separates Rudolf Steiner's work from that of almost all other writers in that he incorporates certain features of Earth evolution, such as time, that could be an important subject, and metamorphosis, well, that could be important too. But what those two things mean, we want to try and shed some light on today. And <clears throat> when I began to think about this, we we ran into the, the work of uh, another individual who, who we're not real clear on his background, but he brought up the idea uh, that in the uh, Oxford Dictionary, if you look up nature, it's presented in a way, I was gonna look it up, but we don't need that. You can go look it up. Look up nature in the Oxford English Dictionary and you get the general impression that it's something that's in opposition to mankind. And so that's that's kind of a, a adversarial view to have of nature. And so uh, in light of that, in our view of, of things as garnered from the work of Rudolf Steiner, it's, it's about living in tune with nature, living in harmony with nature. And so, Perhaps we can approach that subject today. Douglas, how are you? I'm good, John. Thanks for asking. When an old man is asked a question, I usually uh, go on with all my complaints. But today, I'll just say I'm good. And yeah, I like that Zach Bush presentation that we would we both listened to. And then I went to his site. And man, what a compassionate doctor. How extraordinary to find someone so compassionate who's done so much relief work and every place, wherever there's a disaster, he goes. And he's got a group called the Seraphic Group. And they basically are promoting healthy gardening, healthy food, healthy lifestyle. And even though he was one of these pay for view kind of um, vaccination diatribes, which are out there, they interviewed him and they asked him the questions about that topic. And he he didn't dance around it. He answered it, but he answered it in the most beautiful way. He answered it with hope. He didn't criticize the situation. He answered it with hope. And one of the things, yes, that he did point out was that right now, human beings are in opposition to nature. We're warring against nature. We're destroying nature. We're, we're on a path of destruction. And so really, when one starts to have the right relationship to nature, then you can begin to incorporate the components of nature in your own self and realize that whatever you do to nature, you're doing to yourself. And this is critical in anthroposophy, you see, because really when you're talking about a human being, you're talking about the descent from 
the spiritual world down through three stages and we're in the fourth stage. And at that fourth stage, then we become totally human. And then we evolve into angels, archangels, and archai in the future. But we need to remember that the first three stages created minerals, plants, and animals before the human fourth stage. That's us. That's who we are. And if we do not work out a way to integrate, coordinate, and become a symbiotic, wisdom-filled relationship with nature, then we end up killing nature. And in essence, what he pointed out is we can right now are facing the possibility of a human extinction event. And he has done a lot of work with the Aborigine uh, and Aboriginal cultures throughout the world. And they say the same thing. Uh, down in Australia, the um, Aborigines say that the dream time is over, that they can no longer go on walkabouts because the animal group souls don't talk to them anymore. And that the denaturing uh, of their environment, of course, makes it impossible for them to live. And so the people who lived in harmony with nature, the Aboriginal people who lived in harmony with nature, we could learn a lot from them. But one thing is for sure, we are at a crisis point where we literally are saying we are uh, denaturing minerals, plants, and animals, and humans to the point that literally the Holy Grail, which was created by these three incarnations of the earth, and now we are literally the Holy Grail. Our heart is a chalice turned upward to the spiritual world to receive its chrism, its christening oil, this the oil that makes you the anointed one, the Christ, and that is what the Holy Grail is all about. But the Holy Grail is a chalice, and the chalice is a representation of, of course, the mineral plant animal kingdom. And then the blood that is in the chalice, in the Holy Eucharist for the Catholics, the blood that's in the chalice the, and the bread, which represents the body, that's the body and blood of humanity being offered so that it can turn into a higher form of blood like the Greeks called it, Ichor, I-C-H-O-R. And if you have that blood in you, you are immortal. Well, is that not what the entire mystery of the Holy Grail is? It's the blood mysteries of the gift of Christ to human beings so that they can then ascend and become what they're supposed to be, angels, not de-evolve, devolve, and become animals or plants or even into the mineral kingdom. So really, the question of the Holy Grail for Steiner is the entire Christology of how it is that human beings came into existence, how we're sustained, and what we're supposed to be in the future. So he says, when you look at the moon, you can see your name written on the moon in the space that is below the, above the sickle moon. So when a moon is uh, waxing, it represents this chalice, this grail that is becoming something greater than just the chalice itself. It's becoming the pure reflection of the sun when it's at a full moon. And that's what we are. We are human beings who are like the moon and we are the reflection of the sun. In other words, the human being is the reflection of Christ. And this is what the Holy Blood is all about. It's transforming the ego that's in the blood into a spiritual blood, which, as I say, was called ichor. And this ichor is really, it's what makes you divine. And what makes you divine? When you know you're immortal. And what causes that? When you've evolved enough in your path, the Holy Grail, to realize that you are indeed becoming an angel and that your heart is becoming a grail that overflows with love to be able to give nourishment, love, and support and warmth to your environment all around you. That's what the grail is oftentimes pictured as when you're talking Rudolf Steiner's view, the uh, holy blood and the holy grail. Yes. And so if we, if we uh, can just place ourselves meditate, meditatively into this thought that's extracted from Rudolf Steiner in uh, April 24th, 1912. And it's just a short extract of a longer piece, but this will give us a seed thought to work with. He says, and I quote, place yourself meditatively into this thought of a motherless human being. Try to grasp it 
purely spiritually and place a second picture beside it, that of the fatherless Christ. Whereas planetary forces coming from the father are mainly active until the mystery of Golgotha, forces of the cosmos, mother forces are added since then by Christ Jesus. We know that this is that this most important of all earth events falls in the fourth cultural age of the post-Atlantean epoch. That's the Greco-Roman period that started in uh, 747 BC. And so back to the quote, this was preceded by the Egyptian age in which the perfected Isis culture was cultivated in the Egyptian mysteries. Egyptians revered the nature forces that came to expression in all minerals, animals, and plants in the figure of Isis. But an Egyptian soul looked at a man sorrowfully and told himself that he wasn't aware of these nature forces in him. And that's why he thought that Isis was veiled. He said that no mortal was allowed to lift her veil to press towards her. What does this mean? Nothing else than that the goddess lives in the astral world and not in the physical one. And that only someone who's gone through the portal of death or initiation can know her. No living person could lift her veil. That is the effect of the Isis forces was denied to live people. And what were these Isis forces? They were pure mother forces that a man could only be given in the spiritual world before the mystery of Golgotha that is, when he'd gone through the portal of death. So you look at that, and the way in which he develops how we actually experience the, a transformation through the mystery of Golgotha, so that what we have is that the father forces that, that are dominant until we reach about the age of 33, the year of Golgotha, in history, but that up to the age of 33, the father forces are dominant. But yet, if we pick up the impulse from Christ, then we begin to receive that anthroposophia, that, that divine wisdom force that's, that's the transformed Isis force. It's like the, the Mary Sophia force. It's the, the Eve Kadman force, that, that archetypal influx of our relationship to the cosmic processes of the unfoldment within the being of time becomes revealed if we take it up. And in other lectures elsewhere, he makes reference, and I've referenced this before, that during the archangelic period of the Archangel Gabriel, the period of secrecy, the period of these behind the scenes developments that were doing the setup for the age of Michael that was to come in November of 1879. But that during that period, Rudolf Steiner says, through the processes of the generation of the uh, growth and development of culture through all the various aspects of art and music and, and architecture and all the various facets of culture, that that created a context whereby the convolutions of the brain were subtly altered through the remapping of the brain, so to speak, so that it would create a context that in our period, in the age of Michael, we'd be able to take up this relationship to the realm of, of cosmic thought. And that this cosmic thought was going to be able to transform our thinking so that we can develop it into pictures and not just abstract concepts. And so that's a real leading thought to what we're discussing today. Yes, and the talk that we both listened to by Zach Bush, he mentions that because of the patriarchal empire building impulses, that we have one wing of the bird and the bird isn't flying right. And the other part of uh, the wing of the bird is the forces of what he would call, he called the mother forces, but I would call the forces of Sophia or what Rudolf Steiner calls the forces of Anthroposophia. Because without that, you stand as an alone, separate being, motherless and fatherless. 
And this is absolutely critical to understand the Holy Grail. It's what I just made reference to, and John did also. The minerals, plants, and animals are the gifts of the three previous incarnations of the earth. Rudolf Steiner sometimes calls them collectively the mothers. And without knowing the cosmological implications that you yourself have the components that are also found in the mineral, plant, and animal world inside of you, if you don't realize that, then you think that you were born out of nothingness and you're going to nothingness. You have no mother, you have no father. But if you were truly awake and you were beginning to open up your spiritual supersensible organs, you could look at animals, plants, and minerals and see the shadow of the spirit as it manifests through them, which we call, which he called and others call the mothers, the three mothers. Now, that is absolutely critical because without that, you can't build the chalice. You can't build in your heart the capacity to receive the uh, basically the intuitions, the inspirations, and the higher imaginations, all of which have to be morally uh, founded. You can't receive imagination, inspiration, intuition into your heart unless you have a chalice. And then when it comes to the Father God, who is the Father God? The Father God is basically what Rudolf Steiner calls, along with the mothers, he will call the three previous incarnations of um, of the earth, the period which he denotes as the Mars half of incarnation coming down. And then at the mystery of Golgotha, the Mercury half of incarnation started. Well, basically we were given everything all the way up to that point. We were given it. We didn't understand it. We, we weren't in direct communication with it. We weren't taking advantage of the wisdom that was inside of us, the entire plant kingdom, the entire mineral kingdom, the entire animal kingdom is inside each human being. And until you realize that, you don't have really the gratitude and the, the grace, the mercy to understand that you didn't create yourself and you're not creating yourself now and you're not in charge of your own organs. No, you're not. But you are in a communication with spiritual beings who are doing that. So the idea of the grail, Rudolf Steiner says, if you take a lily and you turn it so that it's like a cup, that's a representation of what the Holy Grail is in the human being. Well, that's the human heart. And the human heart is going through metamorphosis. And I can go into great detail on that according to Rudolf Steiner's indications. But the point is, is it's changing. And as that heart becomes a chalice, it actually transforms uh, the geometric form of the heart. It transforms what the heart will become. It opens this uh, the fifth chamber of the heart. We know we have four chambers, but in fact, Steiner says we have seven. So when you're transforming the grail, you're transforming your heart. And recently I did a book on this and pointed out that the heart, from even the moment that you are in utero, they can measure the angle of the axis of the heart they can measure whether it's forward, backwards, left, or right. And before you were born, they can listen to your heartbeat and determine what it is that is going to be the weakness of your body that will probably be the element that causes you to die and when and how long. And the thing that extends your life um, is when your heart has the capacity to change its rhythm by your control not through uh, autonomic nervous system, but through the sympathetic nervous system. When your heart can open itself up and access the fifth, sixth, and the sixth, sixth, and the seventh chambers of the heart, those are the capacities of the grail being given to you. That's when you become the grail queen, get grail king, and marry the grail queen, or one of the grail maidens who actually tends the grail. So this is about a marriage. It's a marriage of the past with the future. It's a marriage of a motherless, fatherless soul with a spiritual mother and a spiritual father. It's the metamorphosis of your heart into an organ of supersensible perception that can sense what's going on inside and outside and create a balance. And that is really what the grail is. It's a gradalis. It's a, it's a slow measured path to receive coming from the future the higher gifts that will flow into you without 
you doing anything except surrendering your, surrendering yourself to being christened, to being anointed. And Christ brings that anointment. So the heart is really the Holy Grail. But of course, one can then say that the Holy Grail can be found in many, many, many other ways. And we talked last time about the blood mysteries of Christ and the way that it was Mary, then the three Marys, the mother of Jesus and the three Marys, who actually protected those blood relics. And that those blood relics are the key to being the inspiration for the pagan mysteries that had to do with the wells of Europe, the water wells of Europe, springs, and that the cup that was always there ready to offer the traveler what, what is called unlimited hospitality, uh, unconditional hospitality. And when you are really living the grail life, that's what your heart does. Everyone who comes to you, you give them something to drink. You give them the waters of life. You give them the food that they need to eat, uh, the nectar and ambrosia of the gods, as it were. And what is that? That's any love given to you by another human being consciously and out of freedom is a gift directly into your grail. It is a, from their grail to your grail, and it's direct nourishment. And that's one of the key factors that you can derive the understanding of the grail. That's why Rudolf Steiner said that spiritual science, as he called anthroposophy, is the science of the Holy Grail. Yes. And so in going into the, the visionary quest, so to speak, that is the story of the grail, you know, leading back really uh, what, what a key element in that whole mystery, other than the ninth century itself, the, the actual chronicle time of Parseval, but that the, the writing down of the story in picture language, which really you could see is beginning with Chrétien de Troyes. And Chrétien de Troyes came up with a description of the grail meal that Rudolf Steiner said was very, very significant in that it dealt with the idea of the, the cosmic nutrition stream and that there's within our human nutrition when we eat food, he said that only the, the most refined mineral substances nourish a certain center within the brain and that that is pointing towards the the activity of your pineal gland and your pituitary gland and that uh, new convolution development that that has since come about within our time period but in looking back to the events of the ninth century rudolf steiner very clearly indicates that parzival was a forerunner and that although it was the intellectual soul period that, that ended in 1413, 1414, that this 2,160-year uh, period was to develop a certain uh, relationship of thinking about the life of the senses, uh, but also pertaining to a level of being able to develop a higher realm of feeling regarding the world. But that in Parseval, what he was able to do was be a forerunner of our current stage of development, the development of the consciousness soul, which in its higher modality is the spiritual soul, which will lead us into the sixth greater period. And so that can sound like just a bunch of descriptives unless you, you start to look more deeply on it. And uh, in the lecture in Berlin on uh, April 24th, 1912, that I referenced earlier. He says the first of these inspiring thoughts is the motherless human being who's called Adam in Genesis. Everything that comes to meet us in the way of a human being is unthinkable if he's not born of a mother. Adam is the only motherless human being. Only father forces were active in him. Of course, we mustn't place him before our soul as a sensorial physical man. Or when Yahweh or Jehovah created the first earth, man in his etheric body 
present physical conditions did not exist on our Earth planet. Namely, he created them out of the Earth planet substances, as the Bible indicates. These substances or earth forces are still present in every man today so that we can say Yahweh is the father of us all and the planet is our mother. So father forces continue to work in men today. They are an earthbound planetary force. They work in everything that's on earth and also in men. For after the conception of the child, the mother's forces work on it, but so do the father forces. They go into the child from the earth via the father and form the upbuilding forces that are most strongly active up to the age 33. And so you see in there a whole developmental series that he's showing that that Adam, who's the, really the Adam Kadman, the, the pre-physical development of Adam that later became the physical development of, of Adam. And you'll see in the Bible, there's two different versions of the Genesis story, by the way, that points towards that. But he's looking back to the Lemurian period that preceded the uh, extensive Atlantean period. And he talks about the uh, pre-earthly gifts of Christ coming forward that, that ultimately developed into uh, thinking, uh, standing upright, thinking, and speaking. So this thinking, feeling, and will, this threefold measure of a human being is really key in understanding this, especially if you bring it into proper association with the words of our Lord, where he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so you see that in the way is that element that is, is coming forward out of the will, and the truth is the thinking principle and then you have that expression of feeling coming forth in the life. And so that we're able to contribute to this whole upbuilding life principle by the way in which we artistically frame our relationship to our world. We could do it through music. We could do it through literature. Douglas is writing a novel that uh, uh, Rudolf Steiner indicated that novel will be an important cultural form in the future which uh, is easily understood because it's a form that can leave you free as do music and painting and dance and all the various art forms that Rudolf Steiner was so conversant in. You see that these are ways of being able to give us something to express this uh, innate capacity in us that is spiritualizing our consciousness. And so it's that spiritualizing of consciousness that's pointed at, because he says, if mankind does not go through the spiritualization of consciousness, which implies coming into relationship with the heavenly Sophia, with the cosmic being of Sophia, that we would just get lost in just the earthly forces. That, that we've inherited that are insufficient to be able to carry us into our future destiny. Yes. Wow. Uh, we seem to be going pretty far pretty fast today, but I'm going to go back and mention that uh, this uh, Mars half of Earth incarnation is very much like... Um, the Father giving you everything that you need so that then you can be a free being to act out of love. And basically, even the building of the chalice is given to you. But then it's your responsibility of what you're going to do with it. So as you move into the Mercury phase of existence of the Earth, uh, you, you leave the gravity phase, you move into the levity phase, and that's probably inspired by the Holy Spirit, by Anthroposophia, the Archangel Michael. And as that is happening, what does it look like? It looks like you're being fed. It looks like you're being invited to a dinner. And at that dinner, just like when Christ had the Last Supper and followed the Hebrew tradition of the Seder, there were four chalices, bowls, chalices, cups, whatever you want to call them. And they represented the four times that God intervened as the Hebrews were leaving Egypt. And so the Passover dinner, which we now call the Last Supper, 
or called the Holy Eucharist, was a representation of the fact that God stands with his people and that the blood of the lamb, which was put over their doorway, would protect them from the spirit of death, which was taking the eldest child from every family in Egypt as one of the plagues that Moses brought on the Pharaoh so that they could be let loose, so they could leave Egypt. Well, what is that? What are those four chalices, right? Then you can hear that there's the chalice that Joseph of Arimathea brought to the Last Supper, and then you hear of other stories. And so the debate of what the Holy Grail is, well, first off, the Holy Grail is a Last Supper. It's a Passover supper meal where you are supposed to be receiving through that chalice your new life to be pulled out of, to be sustained uh, during, uh, and then to be given the promise, and then to be given the strength to fulfill that promise. Well, what is that? That's you accepting your higher self. The story of Israel is simply the story of the human being, almost in mythological terms, because many of the things we're told cannot be substantiated about the Old Testament. So some of those stories are literally telling us, giving us an analogy, giving us a metaphor for what is happening with the soul marrying the spirit. And so that's what you get when you talk about the Holy Grail. You're going to basically eventually be talking about a, a supper or a wedding, or you being the bride and you're going to, and you're New Jerusalem and you're going to marry the lamb because it was the blood of the lamb that saved the people of Israel in Egypt during the Passover. Well, that those are all analogies for exactly what's going on in today's age. If you don't take the Christened part of yourself and put it above your door, then the evil will come in. If you don't, during your meal, thank God in four different ways uh, with the chalices or the cups, the four Seder cups, if you don't thank God for delivering you, if you don't thank God for sustaining you, if you don't thank God for basically, this is your, th this is your body, your, your etheric body, your physical body, etheric body, astral body, ego. That's what the four bowls are. And what are you doing when you actually have a Last Supper remembrance to the Holy Eucharist. You are rising up into the spiritual world to literally drink the blood of Jesus Christ and eat his body. Now, that sounds like cannibalism. And some of the components of the Holy Grail, some of their stories, aren't too far away from that. So is that what we're trying to be told? Is that we need to eat the body and blood of a god as a supper for a communion to lead us into the second half of earth evolution so that then we can become beings who have a new relationship to the mother earth and a new relationship to God almighty through the lamb, through Jesus Christ. Yes, that's what it's all about. So when every time that you eat, what does it mean that you're eating? What does it mean that you're supping with other people or with the divine beings? It means that you are feeding your spirit and the spirit of everyone there so that it can grow into what you're supposed to become. And this is the whole point. If you are on the path of the grail, which in our book on the um, the grail queens, the mystery of the grail queens, it's um, spelled out pretty clearly what, what, what is really going on there. It's called the way, the truth, and the life. The way is the quest of the holy grail. The truth is the fact that the grail is you and the life is what the spirit pours into it. And so we oftentimes see the grail with the Holy Spirit descending and it's overflowing to feed everyone. We have that in the Roman Catholic Church with the uh, sacred heart of Jesus, the sacred heart of Mary, that literally is a sword is stabbing that heart that has the crown of thorns on it and it's bleeding so that that blood, the blood of Christ, the redeemed Christian blood of Christ can then rise up from your heart into your head and bathe those organs that John pointed out. In the head, there is a replica of the grail castle and the grail itself, the pineal gland, the uh, fourth ventricle and the pituitary gland make up the grail castle according to Rudolf Steiner. And sitting on top, the, the pineal gland sits on top of the quadra, uh, corpora quadra gemini 
which is really a cube that's been sliced into eight, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, eight cubes. It's cut in a way that it's a cube that's in eight cubes, and on top of it is a, a tetrahedron, a pineal, the pineal gland. And he says literally that that is the Holy Grail, but that's the past. And so the the deal is, do you want to stay stuck as the king of the grail who was wounded in his thigh and can't really receive the nourishment as he should, but he still witnesses the procession of the grail every day? That is a perfect picture of modern humanity. Modern humanity cannot access the grail. They cannot be the Holy Grail king. And the kingdom around that Grail king, the, the modern person, is desolate. There's nothing living for many miles all around this castle. And it only appears now and then and only appears to the worthy. And once you go in the castle, then the question is not a matter of drinking the substance of the Grail. No, it's not that at all. It's the compassion you have for the Grail King to say, what ails you, my uncle, my relative, my brother? What ails you and what can I do to make sure that it doesn't cause my illness and my inability to become the Grail Queen, King? And that is the, that is the message of our modern times. We are the wounded Grail King who cannot conduct the service properly. And so we witness the grail every day. It happens every single day that you wake up and you have consciousness, and yet you can't tap into that. And then even Parsifal, when he comes to the grail, he doesn't ask the question, what ails you? And because of that, he doesn't receive the grail. And only later does his very odd brother from the east, uh, Farifus, come, and he marries the grail well, not the Grail Queen, but uh, Rapunzel de Soy, the, the uh, bringer of joy, the, the Grail maiden who carries uh, the Grail itself with the spear going on in front of her with the tip of the spear dripping blood, which she's catching either on a platter or in a bowl. So it's Farifus who marries Rapunzel de Soy. So the story isn't quite what we imagine it to be. And so when you here are the modern versions of the Holy Grail. They don't even mention to you that the entire thing is based upon the blood of Jesus Christ and the spear that stabbed it. That's the spear that's in the Grail procession. That's the chalice that's being filled with blood. But what is it that heals you? It's Christ's blood. Christ's blood during the mystery of Golgotha. Joseph of Arimathea was there to catch it, but the first blood in the water that came out from the spear of Longinus stabbing the side of Christ, which of course made that spear holy, dripped into the earth. And according to Rudolf Steiner, that blood redeemed the physical earth. So when we're talking, which also means the mineral, the plant, and the animal. But it is up to us as individuals to consciously make the decision to do something with that etheric blood of Christ that we all have inside of our blood system, inside of our heart, we are the ones who have to do something with that. Just like Parsifal, we are the Parsifal. We're not the Grail King yet, but even if we were the Grail King, we might be a wounded, ineffectual Grail King causing the wasteland to develop all around us. But if we accept the risen blood of Christ, which has redeemed the earth, it's redeemed the, uh, the mineral, the plant, the animal, now it's trying to redeem the human, and it's redeeming it through the etheric realm, we can literally say that the blood of Christ has caused the earth to become alive. It left its descent into entropy, into its constant death mode. It's now in ectropy. It's in life mode. And if we can use the Holy Grail to enter the Grail Castle, what are we going to see? We're going to see the new Grail King. And who's the new Grail King? That is Christ. And Christ is no longer, he was wounded in the side, of course, just like the Grail King was wounded, but he was not ineffectual. He has redeemed the physical. He's redeeming the etheric. He will redeem the astral in the future. And he will redeem the human ego, the human I am, and basically turn all of our blood into the 
blood of the gods, the blood of immortals, the ichor of the gods. So this is the transformation that happens. This is the nourishment. This is the supper. This is the really the rising up into heaven to sit with the higher spiritual beings and sup with them. In other words, to receive the wisdom and the intuitions that we need to fulfill what the Christological cosmology of Rudolf Steiner has pointed out, that we all become Christian beings. So the Grail King, the Grail Queen, they're one. And it's a marriage. And that's inside of us. We don't have to look anywhere outside of ourselves for any of this. This is already at our birth. The etheric blood of Christ is in our bloodstream. Our I am is the proof of it. The, our I am, our ego, is a donation of Christ. And now he is sustaining it, and then he is helping transform it. And that's really the message. It is, uh, you'll hear everyone refer to the Holy Grail as a thousand different things from lapis lazuli to uh, the modern scientists believe the graphene oxide is the Holy Grail. But that's not right. The Holy Grail is inside of you. It is your heart, and it is transforming from a cube into a dodecahedron. And this transformation is a transformation of basically what is inside merging with what is outside and creating a synthesis of it. Same thing Christ did. Christ came from the Trinity. He worked through the sun as the solar logos. He gave us our egos. But first, he, with the Kyriotides, the beings of wisdom, Sophia, they created the world we need to stand on, the world of minerals, the world we need to eat, the world of plants, the world of the animals, which teach us all of the different astral aspects of ourselves that we need to tame and turn into a human instead of a dragon. And that is the reason that the Holy Grail is so oftentimes um, conflated with the Arthurian mysteries. And what are they out to do? They're out to search for the Holy Grail, but on the way, they have to fight evil, they have to fight dragons, they have to fight everything that they encounter so that they can do what? In almost all cases, find their mate, find their love. That is really the Arthurian mysteries. But when it comes down to the Holy Grail mysteries, it's to find the esoteric, the occult, the spiritual meaning of your blood and how your blood can help you become immortal, become eternal, because that is the true nourishment of the grail. It is your own immortality. Yeah, so to, to, to refine this further, Rudolf Steiner in that same Berlin lecture says, the sacred center of forces that was Isis in the Egyptian mysteries is the Maria Sophia in John's gospel in Christianity. It was only the union of ascending and descending forces that took place in the mystery of Golgotha that enabled a man to also feel the activity of mother forces between birth and death. Christ Jesus couldn't get older than 33. From an occultist standpoint, a man is only carrying his body with him like a corpse by the time he's 33. <laughs> of course, the effect of the forces and their change doesn't appear all at once, but happens gradually. The mother and father forces are both in man from the beginning, except that the upbuilding earth forces predominate That's the father forces. During the father forces period, the life we lead is conditioned by our preceding life. But from the time when the dying mother forces predominate, we create karma for the next life through the spiritual force. The father or upbuilding nature force works in us without our help. Whereas to become aware of the effect of the mother force, we must strive and work in spiritual things ourselves. We must become aware of this sublime force, for it's the force that streams into us directly from Christ. So that's one of the most uh, to the point and it's, it's only, it's not something you're going to find repeated over and over again, but that that is the central challenge of the grail, is that we have to respond to these spiritualizing forces. 
so that when we enter into the, the castle of the grail, we have to ask the ailing king, brother, what ails you? Because it's that whole idea of that universally human aspect of Christ, that he's not just here for people that belong to one club or another or one denomination or even one religion or another, that it has to do with the quality of your being coming into expression. And so you, you brought up the uh, interaction between uh, Parseval and how he brings his brother with him, right? So that it has to do, and he's described as, as uh, the piebald, which is like, that's like a checkerboard. It's like a, a combination of black and white. And it's, it's the whole idea of the, the homeopathic uh, dispersion of the grail impulse into all mankind. That it's not something that's just for one particular folk soul or one nation or, or even of one uh, religious view, whatever. It's an actual uh, developing force for all mankind. It's in, within the reach of all mankind to be able to work within the realm of these new developments that have evolved in the brain to be able to receive the spiritualized thinking. And so that's what that is. And so, and it's it's not that you need to be as complicated as Douglas and I, that's not the point at all. It has to do with the mood of soul, which you approach the world that you live in and your ability to be able to love all mankind in the real sense, not just, uh, you know, figuratively, poetically, but to be able to take it into your actual living realm. It's a real challenge. But yet, uh, what I guess Friday was like a, a special day that they created one of those holidays. It's like to, to do something, uh, basically do something for somebody, you be kind to a stranger, kind of uh, an impulse. And that that that's the mood of soul, though. It's kind of funny. It's synchronous. And I saw that and I thought, well, that figures. Given what I'm working on today, uh, hearing that is, uh, well, it's enheartening that there at least is some people out there thinking regarding that thought. And you bring up the doc good doctor going around to all the various disasters, just offering his services to help. That's, wow. You know, who have done, who said, done that you know it's so it's it's all about taking action you know that's the way i felt when i went with steve farmer from the amboy duke so we we went and planted trees and i i planted 10 to twelve thousand loblolly pines that are now 90 feet tall you know i i felt that i was doing something out of gratitude for these forces of nature that have been nourishing me and 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 helping me come to my development Right? Yeah, random acts of love. That was that was what the uh, uh, the thing was on Friday. So the ran, random acts of love isn't that a wonderful concept? And and if we could start moving in that instead of in this very very kind of macabre uh, world of fear that they keep trying to surround us with, just don't buy into it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we are in control of our own destiny and our own supersensible organs determine whether or not we see heaven or hell in perception. Perception, even the superstition science says that whatever it is you're looking at, you yourself change the object you're looking at. Now, hello, that would basically break every single scientific rule there ever was, but they will admit light. They don't know what it is. Is it a particle? Uh, is it a wave? And depending on who's observing it, depends on how it manifests. Well, that's proof in itself that literally the way that you look at the world determines what it is that you're seeing. And when your concepts are so delimited and they're put into uh, boxes and they're very much uh, materialistic, well, then all you're going to see is basically a dead material world, which turns into hell. But if you have super sensible organs and you're developing your heart through the etheric blood of Christ, through the Holy Grail in your mind, excuse me, in your brain, 
through your mind and your heart, through your actions. If you can uh, attune to that, then you can, through your perception, see heaven manifesting all around. You can see spiritual beings manifesting. You can see the shadow of them. Now, it's critical to understand that our nutrition doesn't come to us through food. Rudolf Steiner points out that the food that you take in has very little to do with nutrition. He says that the light you take in and the air that you take in and the water that you take in is really your nutrition. And that sounds, uh, of course, uh, extremely odd, but basically he says that oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, um, uh, sulfur, phosphorus, and uh, I missed one. Anyway, there's four substances. And that's really what, what you break your food down. You break it down into those component substances. And then your version of oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, uh, sulfur, and phosphorus go into the substances that have been destroyed that you're eating, build them up again with your own versions of it, with your own enzymes, because as you know, half the enzymes are provided from your internal self, half are provided from the food. But the food can't actually give you any nutrition without the enzymes in your body, okay? And you are not going to have any nutrition if you don't have, if you're not breathing and the light isn't there. So literally in the future, we can become breatharians. We can learn to live on the warmth, light, sound, and life of the sun. And this is what we don't understand. We think that when the Holy Grail wants to nourish us, then it's going to nourish my desire. And that's what happened to the, the, uh, the maidens of the wells. The aggressive male soldiers who were traveling came along and took advantage of these maidens of the well, stole the golden chalices, poisoned the wells, stole the food, the repast that these grail maidens would give to anyone. And so literally the grail was everywhere that there was a spring or a well. And there was the feminine nature helping people with what they believed was the most important thing, unconditional hospitality, even if you don't know who they are. But the aggressive, dominant, war-oriented patriarch warriors came along and destroyed the wells and grabbed the women who were the maidens of the wells. And that's who the Arthurian knights were fighting against. They were fighting against the evil knights who had who? The fairies, the maidens, the maidens of the wells. There's a thousand names for them, but that's what is going on? So when we're talking about spiritual nutrition, we need to remember that the heart is the center of both the sun, well, the sun, earth, and moon influence combine and come up through the earth in a vortex that comes up and reaches to your heart. And then the celestial spheres, the celestial stars particularly, uh, they actually build you up too, as much, way more than people want to acknowledge. But the point is, is that the influences raining down from the stars from all directions, from the sphere of all the stars raining into us, comes into our head as a vortex, and it comes down to the heart. So the vortex from the heart, from the top, meets the vortex from the bottom, and where they are conjoined, that is your heart. So literally, your heart is receiving nutrition from the sun, the earth, the moon, and the stars every single moment. And we can see this, of course, because without the heart beating, and without oxygenation, and without the nutrition of the blood that uh, carries it, uh, the nutrition to every cell in the body, without the effects of the heart, you would have no life, of course. Uh, but people would try to tell us, of course, that your consciousness is in your head. But that's a starry thing. That's, you know, that's far, far out there. That's very luciferic. And then they'll say, well, the only forces there really are are the forces of the earth and the moon and the sun. Uh, and that's very, very Aramonic. So Lucifer and Araman come in and they interpenetrate. And in the space in between where they have conjoined, where they are mutual, that there is a box. And that box is defined by your left, right, forward, backward, up and down. It's a cube, and it's referred to in Tibetan Buddhism as, as the box, or Steiner refers to it as the box that your karma is stored in from life to life, and every single karmic event in your life is stored in your heart. So when, it, when we come back to it, the issue of nutrition 
is all about understanding what the stars, the sun, the moon, the earth, the planets are all about. Therefore, you have to have a cosmology. As a matter of fact, I'd go so far as to say the pure heart can go just so far like a Parseval. But depending upon his instructions, and he had um, erroneous instructions from his mother, which kept him from attaining the grail at first, and that's what modern human beings are. We believe in science. We believe that science is our mother. Science is our father. Period. You have people who believe in nothing but science, and yet science has never, ever had a theory that has lasted more than 100 years. So science is complete nonsense, and you're not going to receive any nourishment whatsoever from science. Okay? Science is looking at the dead shadow effect of spirit manifestation in this world. That's not going to get you anywhere. What really gets you somewhere is the wisdom that can be arrived from a cosmology that places you in the universe as the answer to the universe. We're not a speck of sand on a, 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 an unnamed beach on a planet that's so small that it's so insignificant. Why are you even considering that it even is worth considering? That's what the science tells us. No, you each one of you and myself and even John Barnwell is the hieroglyphic hieroglyphic monad. It is the puzzle piece that is needed to complete the puzzle. Without it, it's a 3D hologram missing pieces. And you know, if you take a, a hologram and you break it into pieces, every piece will have the same image as the 3D image in it. But the more pieces there are, the less clear it gets. And the strange thing, Strange thing, if you don't get all the pieces when you put them back together, it distorts the original image. Hello? That's the story of the prodigal son. That's our spiritual biography. There's really nothing else but that. We are fractured pieces of a 3D hologram, which is Christ. And until we get all the pieces together, like Kuan Yin, until every single human, she helps because she attained heaven, but she didn't enter the gates of heaven. She stands there and she helps every single other individual enter heaven before she does, including the dragon. So she's always shown taking this vessel and giving the vessel, feeding whatever's in the vessel to the dragon to tame the dragon. So the dragon can go into heaven also. What's the vessel? Look at any of the Kuan Yin, the really good Kuan Yin statues. The vessel's her heart. And Rudolf Steiner said that we store up these karmic, uh, I forget the word he uses, but I'm just going to say particles or monads in your heart and that they go from life to life. So when you meet a really good person, like when I was watching Zach Bush, that man's got a lot of beautiful moral drops in his heart. He is obviously a very moral, very loving person. Funny that he comes to the idea that it's the feminine that needs to be resurrected in our age. And funny that he says that we're at the end of, we're in an extinction event for all of humankind, but that we can go further if we tap into the feminine receptive sides of ourselves and get out of the patriarchal empire building. Same thing with the human heart, same thing with the grail. It's the exact same story. So we've kind of gone full circle here, and but I what with it, before we close out this episode, I'd like to continue with the, the important uh, summation that Rudolf Steiner gives to that Berlin talk, and he says, and I quote: "As so often before, we now get an inkling of the deep meaning of the Rosicrucian verse: We're born from the gods, ex Deo Nascimur." The atom force of the motherless man works on the physical body in an upbuilding and preserving way, whereas what's working since the mystery of Golgotha is the fatherless man, Christ Jesus, the dying force, the force that leads to the dying of the physical body here on earth and that awakens spiritual life if we devote ourselves to it consciously. In Christ we die, that is, die with all our physical concepts and the lower ego that was built up for us while the atom forces were active. And then we'll really experience the last line of the Rosicrucian verse. We're born again in the Holy Spirit. 
And so the Rosicrucian verse that uh, Rudolf Steiner is making reference to is, is a tripartite or three-part verse, ex Deo Nasimur, out of God we are born. So that's the Father. In Christus more and more, in Christ we die. Prospiritum sanctum revivissimus, through the Holy Spirit we are resurrected. And so with that uh, summation, I think we've gained a certain amount of clarity as to how one should spend their time. And that would be within the mood of wonder, awe, and reverence and taking an artistic approach to our world that allows us to be able to create mental pictures out of the out of the content that comes to us so that we could be part of that which is the upbuilding towards the Jupiter evolution, which you may not fully understand what I just said. And of course, that's the beauty of it. And, and expressing it artistically, it gives you the freedom to come to it within your own regard. And so that being said, I want to uh, acknowledge the, the contribution of uh, some very significant individuals in my life. And, and that is that uh, the, uh, this podcast has been made possible by the generous support of Tyla and Douglas Gabriel and Vadim and Viv Vivian and Jinnah and Neil and, and Paula and Rick and Beth and Lee and Kyle, uh, Ina Mira and Ray and Whitney and James and Marilyn and many other people. If I didn't mention you, I, I love you anyways. But uh, those of you that are interested, I have two books. Uh, my first book is The Arcana of the Grail Angel. It's currently reprinting, so you can't get it right now. The Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner of the Underground Streams of Esoteric Christianity which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the True Rosicrucian Order, as a forward by Douglas here, and a great many diagrams based on the diagrams of Aaron for Pfeiffer. All those diagrams are reproduced in my second volume that is now still available on eBay, or you can contact me through the Academia link below or through private message on Facebook. It has a forward by William Bento, the noted Strasford psychologist, and uh, it includes the full series of Grail diagrams. Plus, I added a great many more for this volume. So, if you if you want to just have a few of these left. So, if you're interested, uh, I've given you the information to get them, and you can also get the uh, wonderful library of uh, Douglas and Tyler Gabriel. I put the links for Tyler and Douglas's bookshelf below, and you also have uh, their websites and uh, the books by uh, Douglas. And, uh, by the way, the, their library is available for free if you get it in a digital format, but you can get them in print format. So all those links are below. And if you're interested, you could buy me a cup of coffee at PayPal dot me forward slash John Barnwell 888 and help me uh, keep this message going, but I just can't resist reading one more Rudolf Steiner quote. And so this is from the Gospel of St. Luke. Deeper understanding than exists today is necessary before there can be any true conception of what came to pass on Golgotha. When Earth evolution began, the human ego was connected physically with the blood. The blood is the outer expression of the human ego. Men would have made the ego stronger and stronger. And if Christ had not appeared, they would have been entirely engrossed in the development of egoism. They were protected from this by the event of Golgotha. Why was it that it had to flow? The blood that is the surplus substantiality of the ego. The process that began on the Mount of Olives when the drops of sweat fell from the Redeemer like drops of blood was carried further when the blood flowed from the wounds of Christ Jesus on Golgotha. The blood flowing from the Christ was the sign of the surplus egoism in man's nature which had to be sacrificed. 
The spiritual significance of the sacrifice on Golgotha requires deep and penetrating study. And that's from the Gospel of St. Luke, Lecture 10, The Mystery of Golgotha as a New Form of Initiation. Uh, the link for that lecture is below. And I want to thank Douglas for coming here and give us, giving us his patient wisdom. And uh, he's always somebody that I know that I can just uh, go around any corner I want and he'll be right there with me. So thank you so much, sir. And thank you everybody for showing up. And for everybody else, I want to bid you adieu and thank you for being here. <laughs>